Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. I'm happy to have you here with me today. I had intended to take you on a full garden tour, a July garden tour today. I spent hours yesterday getting all my pathways all weed whacked and mowed and the garden is looking so pretty, but I don't know if you can tell, it is actually raining. And by the look of those clouds up there, it is probably going to be raining for a while. However, I still need to go outside and go down to the garden. What did I need to get? Oh, right, I needed to harvest the basil down in the garden because it is about to flower and I wanna get it cut down and see if I can get one more harvest out of it. Once we get down there, I'll share with you a little bit more about how I harvest my basil all summer long from the same, I think there's probably about 10 or 15 plants or so. Oakley, what you doing? Come here. Come on, buddy. You're such a good boy. How are ya? Good boy. Oh, is she gonna go take your chicken? We did our chicken butchering this morning and both the dogs got a little bit of chicken and Maple is just going up right now to where Oakley's chicken is. Let's see what happens. He's being very respectful of her. So Maple is definitely the dominant of the two. Of course, Oakley's just a pup at this point. So we'll see what happens once he's full grown, but he's sitting back respectfully while Maple is standing over her prize. Maple, what you got? <laughs> She's gonna take it away. <laughs> That's probably a smart move. We butchered around 60 chickens and we have our turkeys left over here. We need to get this pen moved on to, onto some fresh grass for the turkeys. We'll grow the turkeys out for another couple months before we butcher those. So my plan is tomorrow, we are going to make a ton of soup stock together. I'll make sure that I film that. That won't be in today's video, but in Friday's video. I like to leave my chickens for 24 hours at least, sometimes 48 hours before we package them up. That allows their bodies to go through rigor mortis and then the muscles to relax. You can package your chicken up right away. It just won't be as tender as it will be if you leave it. I just wanna run out and check on this. So let's unplug the hot wire here. I'm checking on Thistle quite frequently at this point because I don't have an exact due date for her and uh, she definitely looks like she's getting close. And because she's a first timer, I would like to make sure that I have eyes on her when she goes into labor so that I can make sure everything goes smoothly. Hi everybody! <laughs> Oreo and Patty have become friends. Oh my goodness, look at this. So no matter what we try, come on, no matter what we try, these two little pigs will not stay in their pens. They really love the cows and look at that. <laughs> and they are just so happy being down here with them. I almost don't have the heart to put them back in their pen again. Hi, Oreo. Where's Patty? Oh, Patty's over there. But this girl over here is the one that we're here to see today. Oh my gosh, look at all the flies. Look at all the flies, Thistle. Hey, how are ya? Look at your utter darling. Oh no, you have thistles in your tail, Thistle. I wonder if she'll let me grab it. She is not the friendliest cow in the world. No, probably not. But that is a beautiful looking udder, isn't it? So I know, talking about a cow's udder, using words like gorgeous and beautiful might seem kind of weird, but if you have a milk cow, you know what I'm talking about. A nice square udder where there's lots of spacing between the teats. I'll see if I can show you. Can you see the nice spacing she has? Hi, honey. I think within 48 hours, we are gonna have a calf. So that's exciting. And now it's starting to rain with a little bit more vigor. So let's head back towards the high tunnel. I grow my basil in my high tunnel. I haven't actually tried to grow it outdoors. I'm sure I probably could, but it grows really well in the high tunnel. And I did do some research on topping my tomato plants. So I shared in my last video that I was thinking about topping my tomato plants, but I wanted to do some more research. Whenever you prune a plant, generally what you do is you encourage a bushier plant. So you're gonna get more branching and stuff in the plant below the area. 
where you prune. And so my thought was, if I go prune the top of my tomato plants, then the plant is going to try to put energy into producing a lot of branches. But after doing some research and listening to some feedback in the comment section from those of you that have um, trimmed the tops or uh, topped your tomato plants, it seems that even though that is the case, that it will start to try to branch out at the bottom, as long as you keep on top of that and pull those branches off, it does seem to encourage better tomato growth and more ripening on the tomatoes you already have on the plant. And being that we have such a short season and it was a cold spring and my tomatoes definitely are not as far along as they usually are, I do want to give the plant the opportunity to, oh my gosh, it's really starting to rain now, to um, develop the fruit that they have on them. Um, the other thing I'm gonna do is go pull off all of the flowers that are, oh my gosh, um, all of the flowers that are on the plant right now because they will not have time to produce fruit. Oh, even in the rain, maybe even especially in the rain, the garden still looks beautiful. So close to having zucchinis. Tons and tons of zucchinis. Pickling cucumbers are just taking off. Oh shoot, I thought I was gonna get a chance to show you a bit more of the garden, but it is now really starting to come down. So let's run down to the high tunnel and I'll show you some more of the garden. If the rain chills out here, I think a garden tour is definitely out of the question at this point. Sounds so nice though, doesn't it? Look at these beautiful sunflowers. So these are all volunteer sunflowers that came up in my high tunnel. I planted a few sunflowers in here last year and they uh, seeded everywhere. Look at this. This one must be 10 feet tall. That one up there, it's huge. Look, look at these sunflowers. They are massive. Look at these leaves, just beautiful. Oh my gosh, this one is even taller than the other ones. Wow. I come down to the high tunnel every day and every day I come down and everything looks like it's twice the size as it was the last time I was in. So our tomato plants, this one is over seven feet tall. So I think topping them is probably a really good idea. Oh, I had something else to show you too. We have a couple of ripe tomatoes, just a few. So these are the first tomatoes out of the high tunnel this year. Mm. Yum. Homegrown tomatoes, there is nothing like it. I might be hanging out down here for a little bit until this rain chills out a little. But we do have a little bit of harvesting to do in here. Actually, there's a few things because we're gonna harvest some peppers too. But we're going to start with this basil. So you remember, we cut this basil down, right down to here. Um, when was that? Two weeks ago now? And that was already the second harvest that we had done on our basil. So now we're going to do the exact same thing again. We're gonna cut them right down right to here so you can see all these other little branches and these will grow again and we should be able to get at least one more harvest off of these so there we go now we'll see again in a couple more weeks if we can get another big harvest off of these guys hiding in way back here I have these peppers that are called Ring of Fire. So they are supposed to be super hot. And I'm gonna pick up, pick off all these red ones. This poor little plant has been completely choked out by these sunflowers. I'm not entirely sure what I'm gonna do with these little peppers. I'll probably pickle them. One of my kids loves hot stuff. That was the reason why I bought this one was for him. Oh shoot, I didn't mean to pick this. <laughs> this is a paprika pepper and I like to wait till these ones get red. There is a banana pepper, another one. Oh, this is so exciting. Look 
at all the tomatoes. Can you see those ones back there? Up here, over here. So encouraging, you guys. Look at that one. Our apron is full. We need to go back up to the house and it is coming down. I should have brought an umbrella with me. Oh my gosh. <sighs> Shall we brave it? Okay, let's do it. Just do a quick peek on the garden as we go past. Look at how beautiful it's all looking. We can do another huge harvest on these. So beautiful. Okay, time to go. I am going to make a soup, a cozy soup with probably baking powder biscuits. You guys even see me with all this rain on the lens. All right, we have all sorts of things happening in the kitchen now. My son tried the ring of fire peppers and said they were really, really good. They were hot, but not like blazing hot. So I'm going to pickle up a jar of these for him. We'll throw in the yellow peppers and a couple of these paprika peppers into that. I don't know if we'll get that to that today, but we'll see. We are going to wash up all of this basil. Isn't that gorgeous? All of this basil that we just picked and get that put, where are we gonna put that? We'll put that onto trays into the freezer because I actually have four trays of raspberries that we picked yesterday that have to go into the freeze dryer. I have milk. So do you remember day before yesterday when we milked, I had all of that extra milk and I didn't have our new fridge yet. Um, so I decided to freeze dry that milk and it's now finished. So I'm going to get that packaged up. We did get a new fridge. Yay! So it's just an all fridge. It's the same fridge that we had before, but it has a good warranty on it. Um, but it is white. So I've decided to transition back to having all white appliances. We got stainless steel appliances about three years ago or maybe four years ago now. And at least for us and our family with the amount of use that our appliances get, they are just impossible to keep clean. And you would think that white appliances would be worse but they are not. Every single drip mark shows up on the stainless. And when we were looking at appliances, the salesman was trying to convince me <laughs> that the new finishes that are on the stainless steel make them not show fingerprints and stuff the same way. But what they do show, regardless of whether they show fingerprints, is drip marks. I don't know if you can see that over on my dishwasher down there, but any drip mark shows up on it. So I'm very excited to have white appliances again. Um, the all fridge is fabulous. We do have four big freezers that we keep all of our meat in, so I don't really need the small freezer that comes with your kind of normal fridge. Um, but we definitely, because we have all the dairy coming in and I like to keep that on my main floor fridge, uh, having the all fridge with the shelf for the dairy is fantastic. So the other thing that we have done here is all of the prep work for the soup that we're gonna be making. I have some ground beef and ground pork sitting in a bowl of water over there that we're gonna fry up and we're gonna kind of make a hamburger soup stew, I guess a stoop <laughs> um, for dinner tonight with some baking powder biscuits. And it's the perfect day for that with it being kind of rainy and a little bit chilly outside. So where should we start? I have the freeze dryer trays warming. The freeze dryer has an option for warming the trays first. And I highly recommend if you do have a freeze dryer that you do that because it stops the condensation from forming on the frozen metal when you take them out. And the last thing that you want is any type of moisture at all getting into your freeze dried products. So we're gonna pull out the blender because I did find when I did my freeze dried milk last time that um, not having it blended up really fine made it a little bit chunky when I reconstituted it. So update on the pepper. <laughs> My son now, after thinking about it and eating the entire thing, has said that it is actually very, very, very hot. <laughs> so I'll definitely mix it up with some of the other peppers, the sweeter peppers, to counteract that heat a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna run down and grab our freeze-dried milk. It, the oil-free pump doesn't require any changing um, of the oil or anything. It just makes this really loud noise that you can hear down there for about five minutes. We decided to go with the oil-free pump just to save that extra step of having to change the oil. I know lots of people that have the pump that you have to change the oil on and they say that it's not a huge deal, but we decided to go with the oil-free one so, oh, I'll show you. <laughs> this is what freeze-dried milk looks like. Kind of pretty. 
So we're gonna put this in, then we're going to wash these trays, wash our basil, put the basil on, pop those in the freezer. Because um, herbs don't require a long freeze dry time just because they don't have a lot of moisture in them, you don't have to pre-freeze them, but I am going to because I have that batch of raspberries that I wanna get into the freeze dryer. Our raspberries this, this year are so fabulous. And I wanna to try to freeze dry most of them because I have enough jam to last us a year so I don't need to make any more jam. So I was planning on storing this because all the milk that I'm freeze drying is for long term, my long term food storage layer. And I uh, was going to do it in Mylar with an oxygen absorber, but I don't have any oxygen absorbers left. So I am going to put it into a jar with a tight fitting lid and then I have my oxygen absorbers on order and then when I get one, I'll throw it in there. It should be okay for a little bit without the oxygen absorber. Oh, it looked like it's, looks like it stopped raining. We might be able to go out and do a little garden tour after we had the soup cooking or on the stove. It's gonna cook for at least an hour just to meld all the flavors together. Okay, once this has browned up, we are going to add in our garlic and our onions. I'm gonna run down to the pantry. Actually, I'll bring you with me. The pantry is starting to fill back up again, slowly but surely. Okay, this is such a mess in here. Such a mess, but it's starting to fill back up. Slowly but surely, uh, these pork and beans that I did with you guys the other day, they are so good. We love them. I wanna make many more jars of that, but what do we need here? Um, need some canned tomato sauce. A couple cans of tomato sauce. I'm really trying to get through my canned tomatoes. Okay, that should be good. All right, let's see our ground beef and ground pork. Just about done, close enough. So we have three onions and four cloves of garlic in there. And we'll stir that in. And we'll also add some basil. Actually, you know what? We have all that fresh basil, so we'll add some of that. We'll add basil leaves in there and a bay leaf. Actually, make that two bay leaves. The sun is starting to come out again, so that's awesome. We'll be able to go wander around the garden. I'm just going to simmer this soup for around an hour until all the veggies are soft and in the meantime, we will go outside. Last year I did a no-till garden and actually for the last couple of years I did a no-till garden. And then this spring I was kind of overwhelmed by the chaos that was my garden and I decided to just till up the whole entire thing, which was a fantastic decision and I haven't regretted it for a minute. But now I'm kind of thinking no-till again and I'll show you why in a minute. For those of you that are new to my channel, this is what I call my forest garden. So there's three 30 foot rows that are about 10 feet wide and they are filled with perennial herbs and flowers and fruit trees, lots of fruit trees in here. We have elderberry, echinacea that's just about to bloom, sea buckthorn. I did prune back that burdock back there that I was talking about the other day. Burdock is a medicinal plant. It's actually a weed in most places, but um, it has these horrible burrs on it. So I cut it right back. You don't want to harvest the root until fall because then all the plant gets signaled to put all of those nutrients back down into the root for the following year. So that's the prime time to harvest it. But I didn't want to give it enough time to actually form those burrs and then get that spread all over the place. So I cut them all off the other day. 
This is a bee balm here. It is so beautiful when it blooms. I'll show you. It has these gorgeous purple flowers and the bees genuinely love it. So beautiful in here after the rain. Some beautiful yarrow. These guys, this is columbine and it just keeps blooming this year. Normally it's well spent. I mean, it's mostly spent um, right now, but there's still a few blooms left. My comfrey that I stomped down around my fruit tree is starting to come back up over there. And the raspberries, oh my goodness. We have been harvesting off of this four days and we will be for another week or so yet. So gorgeous and delicious. Walking through the forest garden is a kind of a magical feeling for me because I planted this garden five years ago now and to see it look very similarly to the way that I had imagined it to look in my mind. It's even more um, jungly in here than I thought it would be. It's just such a fun thing. We have fruit coming on. These are apples on the fruit trees and this raspberry patch being so prolific. I would really encourage you if you're thinking of growing a little orchard, if you have the space to do that, even if you're just gonna grow four or five fruit trees, um, to do something with it that turns it more into a foresty kind of feel. So where you have the understory down at the bottom and then the mid story and then the upper story with the fruit trees up above because there's just something so magical about it. And we have found so much wildlife making their home in this space. There's snakes and frogs. Um, we only have garter snakes up here, so they're not poisonous or anything. There's frogs, so many different pollinators visit this space. And I just love it so much. It makes my heart very happy. And then there's my vegetable garden, which is bringing me so much joy this year, you guys. Oh my gosh. So here's my thought about turning this garden back into a no-till garden. So I have all of these pathways that are lawn and I just keep them mowed down and I really like the way that it looks. And then I have all of these beds and I bought this little tiller. It's just a small little cultivator tiller. And I was thinking that when I put the garden to bed this year, I'll pull everything out of the beds themselves, top them with compost, and then just till that in, um, just the first couple of inches in the spring and keep this configuration because I just love it. It looks so beautiful and it's really easy to work with because I made the pathways wide enough to fit my wagon and my wheelbarrow. This, I love how inviting it is with the grass pathways and then going up into the forest garden through the arch or over this way. It just looks like a space that you want to walk around, kind of park-like, and I love it. I suppose I could just till it up in the spring again and start over the way that I have, but I really, really love the configuration of the garden the way that it, it is. So I think I'll probably just leave it. Oh, we have another cauliflower. It's pretty much ready to go. Let's just cover it up so it doesn't get sun bleached until I'm ready to harvest it tomorrow. Carrots are looking good. We have some beautiful beets hiding in here. And these closed up with the rain, but these are the most glorious, glorious poppies I have ever planted. This was a rainbow mix. There's dark burgundy ones, light yellow, pink over here, and this gorgeous orange color. Maybe they'll open back up again now that the sun's out. And if they do, I'll show you the onions looking beautiful. So this is some abundance kale that self-seeded in this spot. So I've decided to let it go again and do the same thing. This little sunflower here also self-seeded here last year. There's a bumblebee in there. Beautiful marigolds, another gorgeous sunflower. Look at the celery. It's really starting to look like something here. When I make my chicken broth tomorrow, I'm going to be com coming down and harvesting a bunch of the celery to throw in there, a bunch of the onion tops to throw in it. I always just come down and grab a bunch of veggies and just throw it into my giant pot. Oh my word, we are going to have to start harvesting cabbages. Look at these beauties. These are one of my favorite cabbages. This is the Copenhagen market cabbage. Beautiful, starting to head up nicely. Oh look, it's one of my honey groupies. 
The plan with the cabbages is to make a ton of pickled coleslaw, my kids love it, and sauerkraut. We are also going to make a ton of cabbage rolls. We love cabbage rolls, and then we're just gonna freeze them because they freeze up really nicely. These are some of my winter cabbages. This is a green acre cabbage. So hopefully these guys will be able to go into my root cellar. Look at those water droplets on there. Isn't that gorgeous? The zinnia are finally starting to come on. I didn't prune these guys back and I should have. So this is what happens when you don't top your zinnia plants. If I had topped it down here when it was around this high, it would have branched out and been much bushier, but as you can see, it's kind of tall and skinny. It still looks beautiful, but it's not nearly as bushy as I usually like them. You can see how much shorter this guy is right here, but this is one that I did top, but there's so many more flower heads on it. Huge splash of orange back there. Corn is starting to tassel already. I don't think I'm gonna get a lot out of this little patch of corn. These are, um, this is called paint, Painted Mountain. A lot of this corn and also some glass gem. Um, last year I actually grew quite a bit of corn. We have a farm that is a couple of hours from here and they grow sweet corn and it's a you pick and they're really affordable. And so even though I was successful at growing a, a larger amount of corn last summer, and I think we canned maybe 10 quarts or something out of it, for the amount of space that it takes up and how much uh, care I have to give them because I have to start all of these in my greenhouse, all of my corn, because it's too cold here in the spring, it isn't worth it for me. So I just decided to grow a couple of these just for fun to see if I could. And with the cold spring, I don't think it's gonna work out, but we'll see. The calendula is starting to bloom over here. Squash plants are sending up a ton of flowers, but there is not a lot of fruit in there. I love this bluish kind of leaf on this nasturtium. Isn't that gorgeous? Wagon looking lovely. Needs a little bit of deadheading. Now, how are our pickling cucumbers looking? There's lots of little pickles on there. Little tiny baby ones, but still not a lot of fruit. I am not minding one bit that these are taking a while because there's so many things coming out of the garden. And now that we have all that cabbage to deal with, I think there's probably 20 heads of cabbage that need to be processed in the next probably few days. Plus we have all of the chickens to part out and can. Plus we have all of the chicken broth to make. If those can hold off for another week, that's, that's actually perfect. I hope they do. I planted a ton of cauliflower this year and it wasn't really intentional because I ended up losing quite a bit of my cauliflower to the duck in the garden incident. I ended up um, planting a whole bunch to replace all of them, but a lot of the ones that they munched on actually ended up coming back. So I have probably twice as many, maybe not quite twice as many, but quite a few more than I had originally anticipated for um, cauliflower, which is great. I am not complaining and these just are so gorgeous. Look at that. It's huge and it's beautiful. And we have lots and lots and lots of them that are coming on. So these guys over here are the ones that came back after the ducks had munched on them. And as you can see, they're just little tiny heads here. So I am glad I planted as many as I did. I still have not harvested the kale. Isn't that beautiful? I almost don't wanna harvest it because it just looks so gorgeous. But I am wanting to make green powder with this for smoothies and soup and everything in the winter time. But my freeze dryer is just running full out right now with things that can't sit in the garden. Like the kale can sit in there until the fall and it actually is sweeter if you leave it until a frost. So nothing's really being hurt by leaving it there. Things like the raspberries need to be processed right away, put into the freeze dryer. And I don't have any room in my freezers at this point to store stuff in my freezers. So the kale will just have to stay there for a little bit yet. So this garden definitely gets most of my attention. I just love spending time down here. Uh, my crop garden that's up over this way, not so much. Let me show you. 
Oh my, <laughs> it's even worse than I remembered. Um, <laughs> there's onions in there. You can probably see them poking up. Back over there is potatoes. And beyond that, there are carrots that have not been thinned at all. This garden is usually mulched really well and I don't normally weed it. But this year, it basically got planted and then abandoned. And also the potatoes were planted about three to four weeks later than they should have been. So I'm just kind of letting it do its thing. And I've just had to kind of let go of it because otherwise I'm just gonna be stressed about it. The only thing that I don't really love about this particular garden is that as soon as I come home, this is the first thing I see. My other garden is tucked in down this way and you can't really see it from up at the house. And so I think next year I might do something a little bit different and try to make this garden a little bit more of a beautiful space, similar to my main garden down here, just for my own sake so that when I come home, I don't see this <laughs> situation that is going to be here this year. And again, I just gotta let it go. Okay, it's been almost half an hour, so we're gonna head back up to the house, give our soup a stir, get onto the baking powder biscuits so that we have those ready when the soup is ready and we can sit down and enjoy a nice, warm, cozy meal. It does look like another storm is rolling in up over that way. Oh, and up over that way, actually. Okay, so we are going to be making the baking powder biscuit recipe out of my cookbook, which I am so excited about. I'll be able to offer it to you on my website within a couple of days from today. And like I've mentioned a, a few times, if you wanna be notified when I have stuff available outside of um, on my YouTube videos, you can sign up for my newsletter. And I don't have a spammy newsletter. I don't send it out um, more than a couple of times a month and I'll notify you via that newsletter when my cookbook is available for direct purchase from me. You can actually buy it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and all of those places, but we are trying to make it even more affordable by being able to sell direct from my own website, and we are having some shipped up to Canada so that I can ship them out to Canadians from here to keep shipping reasonable. And then we're going to be, uh, we also have a place down in the United States that are gonna be shipping them out to keep them really affordable for my American uh, subscribers. And then for anybody that's international, I would recommend that you purchase it from Amazon because they will ship all over the place and usually their shipping is really affordable. I've been getting some feedback on my cookbook and one of the things that I'm really happy with is that people are excited about the fact that the pages are big, the font is large, so it's really easy to read. And this was actually at my mom's recommendation uh, because she said for anybody who's getting older, whose eyes are failing them a little bit, and I'm actually in that camp now, I usually have to wear reading glasses. I don't have to with this cookbook because the font is nice and large. We also have photos on every page of every recipe so that you can see what the recipe is supposed to look like when it's complete. So let's find the baking powder biscuit recipe. So there we go, my baking powder biscuit recipe, and we have it right beside the beef stew recipe just because they taste really, really good together. Let's grab a mixing bowl here. So this recipe calls for buttermilk, which I don't have. So the substitute for buttermilk is a little bit of vinegar with your milk. So just a splash of vinegar, and then that will curdle it, acidify it, so that it is a similar acidification to buttermilk. I am considering doing a bit of a kitchen makeover. If you have been here for any length of time, then you know that I have made over my kitchen multiple times since we bought our place. Um, so what I'm thinking of doing right now is changing the cupboards, the color of the cupboards. I was thinking of going, I had a sage green in here that I really, really loved before back to the sage green again, but I'm worried that it will look weird with the gray floor. So I'm not opposed to keeping it, I'll just have to give it another coat. I did save some of the paint that I mixed to freshen them up, but I just feel like I need a change. And the other thing that I'm going to need to do is to get some new curtain toppers because with all of the white appliances, I think it's just gonna be too much white. And I'm thinking of just doing something simple like checks or something, I don't know. Anyway, if you have any ideas, let me know. I would love to hear your suggestions. We're going to do one cup of 
whole wheat flour and it's a stone ground flour so I don't want to put too much in it or I won't get a great rise on my biscuits. Do you hear that beeping? This is one of my favorite features of this fridge is it has an alarm so that if it's not closed properly it beeps and you would not believe the number of times throughout the day that that happens so I don't know how many times we had our door left open before we got a door with an alarm but I won't ever go back to a fridge. Whoops. <laughs> And some baking powder. <coughs> One, two, three, four. A little bit of baking soda. And then we'll mix that all together. Add a little shake of salt. Okay, you can use lard, you can use shortening, you can use butter. In this recipe, I am using lard. I actually have a ton of pig fat to render down and for my lard for the winter. But as we go throughout the harvest season, I'll go through all these things with you and then we'll round it out with a pantry tour at the end. And I'll show you what we end up with at the end of the season. So just want to mix this in. You can use a pastry cutter. That's better than using your hands just because this really does soften up the fat and it is better for a better rise. It's better to have your fat be cold, but as usual, I'm not following the rules. <laughs> so we're going to make a well in there, rinse my hands off, I'm going to add our soured milk and stir it all in. Okay, now that we have our dough, we need to clear a space so we can roll it out. So I just dump it all onto the counter like this and then give it just a little bit of a knead. You don't want to mix up your baking powder biscuit dough too much because it makes it tough and you want it nice and light and fluffy. So once it's holding together, even just like that, that is sufficient um, amount of kneading. So I like to roll mine out and then fold them over. Roll it out again. And then fold it over one more time. This makes for lots of nice layers in my biscuits. And then roll this out to about three quarters of an inch. And if you have a biscuit cutter, which I currently do not, then you can use that. But whatever you do use, try to make sure that it has a nice sharp edge. I preheat my oven to 450. I'm using a heart cookie cutter. When you are cutting biscuits, try not to move your biscuit cutter back and forth, or if you're using a cup, don't twist it because you bind the edges of your biscuits together when you do that and you don't get as much of a rise. So just try if you can just push straight down. Then you'll get a nice crisp edge and a nice rise on your biscuits. Okay, now we'll pop these in the oven for 10 to 15 minutes or until they're golden brown. All right, there is our soup and I slightly overcooked the biscuits. So they're a little bit more brown than I normally like them to be, but that is going to make a yummy meal. I hope you enjoyed today's video everyone and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.